Well, the vibe today is very exciting because we have a lot of pedestrian activity, which of course is one of the focuses and visions of the Urban Village Plan. There's places for people to go. There's restaurants, there's uh, shopping, there's where we are here in front of the post is a music venue. So just lots of things to bring people down here rather than just office space. Probably Race Street historically was sort of the commercial hub of the Riverside area, sort of the downtown of Riverside, if you will, where a lot of the services and businesses were located. But over time, of course, that changed. A wake up call for the neighborhood was probably the imminent planned demolition of the Mac Adams building, which was going on in around 2004, 2005. When that building was able to be saved and preserved and rehabilitated, it just created a lot of energy and excitement about what the future of Race Street could be. And of course, at that time, uh, development interests started occurring. And so there were people, you know, interested in doing things over here. You know, it's kind of a double-edged sword. You're, you welcome outside investment and new ideas and new thoughts and plans, of course. But at the same time, there's there can be a little bit of a fear factor of what may happen. I think what there was a fear of would be that it could be possibly too much nightlife. That was sort of an initial fear. That did not come to pass. A second thing was, which is still a concern now, was the influx of apartment units. How many could the street, the urban village, the community support? Riverside Baptist Church was a very large congregation, an old congregation in the Riverside area. They have a very large campus with some very large and what I would consider monumental buildings. There was a threat that those buildings would be demolished to build uh, new apartments. So residents, first of all, were concerned about additional apartments. Secondly, just the, the loss of those buildings and how it would affect the streetscape and sort of the, everything about this area because they've been anchors for the six, point, six Points intersection for so long. Uh, so it really brought the community together. We had someone come in who was willing to save the buildings and convert them, the buildings themselves, to apartments, but it was going to be an affordable housing project. And that created concern with a lot of the community members, but there was a lot of uh, public input education done by the uh, developer of that project and at the end of the day everyone was anxious to see those buildings preserved. They recently were listed on the National Register of Historic Places. The developer sought state and federal preservation tax credits to help with the financing for the project and they've done a great job working with our uh, preservation office to make sure that the rehabilitation is um, appropriate. Well, we wouldn't be able to support a preservation program in Fort Worth or have historic districts without neighborhoods or neighborhood organizations. Um, it's a completely grassroots led effort. We uh, work with them very closely to ensure that what's important to them is retained and um, protected for the future. So it's sort of been a success story uh, for the community and now we're going to get to keep these just beautiful and again I'll say monumental structures uh, and you won't even really be able to tell that they're apartments but we won't have this gaping hole that would have been there if they would have been demolished. Race Street is an urban village but it's also in a neighborhood empowerment zone so people can take advantage of both programs at the same time. The NES program will waive a lot of your development fees so that's a really big savings for developers um, or individuals because the program is for single family, multifamily, commercial, industrial, and mixed use. This building actually took advantage of the facade improvement program. The concept behind the facade is that's the first thing that everyone sees when they drive down the street. So that's what you notice and that's what will bring you to an area the Facade Improvement Program will reimburse developers $1 for every $3 that they spend on improvements to the facade, and we reimburse up to $30,000. So your doors, windows, permanent awnings, painting, replacing brick, wood, 
everything on the facade of the building. The neighborhood associations and particularly the Riverside Alliance, which is a coalition of our seven neighborhood associations. We monitor what's going on with the city planning department very carefully, including the comprehensive plan, because updates are made to that every year, which can sometimes change the trajectory of where developers are looking. We just try to stay abreast of what may be coming and what's out there and keep our sort of our ears to the ground, if you will. I would say work as closely with your elected officials as possible because they often know of a project or development interest long before anything is happening and long before the public may know. They may not always be at liberty to share that with you, but uh, you just have to stay ahead of what's happening because once a developer goes in for maybe a zoning change or building permits or something like that, the plans are in motion and it's often too late to change anything and it may not be something that you're comfortable with and you may not have had input into that plan. I think the developers would do themselves a big favor if they would reach out to those groups that are in the area when they arrive on the scene. Uh, to get the lay of the land, to start building some relationships there, because the developers may just not have an awareness, you know, and that you can't hold that against them. They may not know uh, the character, the, the thoughts, and, and what people are thinking in the area. So I, I really think communication both ways is vital and uh, is a two-way street, and it can, uh, you know, head off a lot of miscommunication and disagreements about some things. Neighborhood Empowerment Zone program is for all kinds of development. One of the biggest is single family development and redevelopment of existing homes. So it encourages people to make improvements to their own home and they get a break for doing it. It is the only program that will let a homeowner get a tax abatement. There's the local historic site tax exemption which um, will basically freeze your property value at pre-renovation levels for 10 years. There's state and federal tax credits, uh, which can help offset about 45% of rehabilitation costs on historic structures. It's been a great benefit to our neighborhoods over the years. Um, it's provided a lot of positive change, and um, we've seen great success with preservation in Fort Worth. The decision makers, not only the staff, the professional planners, uh, but your elected officials also need to know that there is interest, that there's citizen engagement, and that we want our voices and opinions taken into account. I would just say that patience is important. The development here on Ray Street has taken a long time to come to fruition, and I think it's really gaining momentum now. There have been some setbacks, but uh, I think that's the main thing, patience, because it's not going to happen overnight or even in a year. We want to protect our historic resources as well as attract new development and new construction, and we, think, we don't think they're mutually exclusive.